Welcome to lecture 22, where we continue our discussion of at grid intersections. Uh, today we'll be looking a little more in depth at how to do islands. We looked, talked about that a little bit on the last, uh, the last round. And if I get this to move forward, there we go. Factors that affect our channelization. So we talked last time a lot about channelization and why it was good and why we use it and how it could be overused and also cause troubles. Uh, through that. So remember, channelization is anytime we put traffic into certain channels and we keep, basically we're trying to keep single movements in a similar set of either a single lane or, or a group of lanes. So it could be a single left turn lane, it could be two left turn lanes, but we're moving all of that left turn traffic out of the main flow, the main channel, uh, and putting it into its own. So that's channelization. We often do that with right turns as well. So that's typically where we're channelizing uh, traffic flow. Right. And we talked about the reasons that we like channelization are it makes things safer and it makes traffic movement more efficient, uh, particularly where you have traffic signals. And a lot of times it reduces confusion of the drivers, which is one of the reasons why it's safer uh, through that. So what affects channelization and where we can use it and where we can't. So some of our things to keep in mind as you're thinking about, well, should I channelize this intersection or not? The first one is, do you have enough property? Do you have enough space and right of way that you can put that in, uh, put channelization in there? Because it's it typically is going to widen your, your intersection a little bit if you've got islands, right? If it's just... Uh, striped lines, not so much. Islands, even more. But if you're going to add a left turn lane, that's you know minimum of 12 feet extra pavement you have to have. You have to have the room for that. So a lot of times in an urban environment, it's pretty hard to do channelization or as much as you want to do. You're probably limited on that because of uh, because of how much right of way you you have available or that you can buy or do there at a reasonable cost through there. Uh, what's the cross sections of the crossing roads? So if, if you're trying to put an intersection with channelization in and the main road is on a curve and has super elevation, that's a bad place to try channelizing. Uh, that's a, not a good place for an intersection at all. You can do it. Uh, we've, I've done at least one project before on a super uh, through that, it's it's just hard. So, what are the cross sections of those of the crossing roads? What do they look like? Do they already have curb and gutter? Is it um, is it open ditch section through there? Those are all things you should keep in mind. Of will channelization work here? Right. Uh, what's your terrain? Right. Again, if it's if it's a tight area, if you're on the side of a hill or a mountain, if you're in a more mountainous area, it's going to be really hard to get channelization to work. Uh, in there, it's going to be very expensive, you know, to get enough flat spot to put this in. So think about that. What's your terrain there? Uh, in certain turning movements, especially where you have trucks, you don't want too much of a cross angle. So you got to be careful that your terrain isn't on the side of a slope. You don't have a lot of sloping terrain that might um, tip over trucks if they're too tall. So like about a 4% cross slope is about all we'd want to go on a turning movement for a truck. Otherwise, you, you may cause tipping uh, through there. Well, Speed is usually involved in that too, but we try to keep it under 4% and that's generally safe. You know, truck drivers won't go too much faster than that through there. Other factors, uh, how much, how many vehicles and how many pedestrians do we have per hour or during the peak hour typically is what we're looking at or maybe uh, throughout the day through there. We, why do pedestrians matter? Why do pedestrian volumes matter? Because sometimes we use channelization with an island to give a pedestrian refuge. It's a place for the pedestrians um, to get out of the traffic. Uh, we talked about that last time as well, sh shortening the crossing distance uh, through there. If you have a very low pedestrian volume, you don't need to worry about that type of island. You may still want to channelize for traffic flow, but you won't worry about the pedestrian piece. If pedestrians are there, we'll change how we design islands to make sure we've got enough space for uh, pedestrians to stand safely uh, out on the island through there. If you're in an urban environment and you have buses and other transit uh, things nearby, you're going to make sure that you've got a space for that. So where you build your channelization does not prohibit having a bus stop or will not interfere with how the bus stops and tries to pull back out in traffic. If you've got a right turn lane right there that's often backed up, that's maybe not a good place to put it uh, or put a bus stop there. So move one or the other if you can through that. What kind of traffic control device do we have? Is it stop controlled or is it 
uh, traffic signals. That's these are your at grade intersections. Those are our two main types, right through there. Could be a roundabout as well. It's a little bit different animal uh, through there. So uh, how we channelize is going to depend a little bit on like, especially for retrofitting an intersection. There's already traffic signal poles there. We're going to change probably how we do our channelization. We're going to have to miss where those poles are. It may preclude us using like a right turn bypass lane, something like that. So we just got to know where that stuff is and plan for it. And if you're putting a new traffic signal in, it's often a great time to channelize and you can get things right where you want them to be. All right. Well, how big is our, the vehicle we're designing for, right? Is it that WB50? Is it a WB67, the Indiana design vehicle? Or is it just passenger cars, right? That's going to make a big difference in how we channelize and how wide uh, these lanes need to be, especially the, the turning roadways through that. And then what's our approach speeds, right? So channelization works great in urban environments, obviously. It's delicate. It's a delicate mix. Uh, if you're at high speed out in a rural situation, if you're at 55 miles per hour, you've got to be careful that you don't um, <laughs> drop really small islands in all of a sudden uh, on people and have very abrupt uh, changes uh, to taper people around those islands. All right, so you have to be much, uh, you have to really think about that, be more careful uh, at higher design speeds. That's why that, that matters for us there. So these top ones, we say that's the extent of channelization. How much, uh, how far back from the center of the intersection do we want to channelize things? How far around the corners do we want to do it? All right, through there. The last two ones, what size our design vehicle is and what our approach speeds are, that's going to be related to how we design the edge of pavement, which is a term we're going to get into that you're designing the edge of pavement. Um, it's, uh, again, for a, a large vehicle doing a, a turn, you're going to have to have a larger radius. You know, to get the curve, you're going to have to put in the tapers and the offsets we talked about right before spring break through that. All of those things, you know, fit into that. You're going to have to have a larger uh, radius, and that's your edge of pavement is going to be further back away from the intersection. You're going to widen that piece out, right? The approach speeds, the edge of pavement is is an issue because you're going to have a much longer taper. You're going to slowly move people over to the right as they come up on an island on a high speed approach than you would in a short speed approach. So you have to start much further back and and be much more gradual in your transition into that intersection piece, right? there. Things to think about when you're designing for channelization, you're trying not to make the drivers do more than one thing at a time. So we, everyone thinks they're great at multitasking and you can see all the wrecks that are caused by texting and you realize, no, people aren't that good at multitasking. They're pretty bad at it, right? Um, we've known this for a long time. They're, they're not that good at, at multitasking, right? You know, listening to the radio and driving may be the only two things they can handle at once when they're driving safely, <laughs> safely handle at once uh, through there. So we're trying Trying, when we do this channelization, don't make it complicated. If you make it complicated, there's too many decisions, too much going on at once, your accident rates are going to go up. And that's how we know that people aren't handling it well, as we see it in the accident rates after it's been built. So you won't know it for a couple years. Well, you might you might get complaints early on, and we've had that happen before. But you, you'll see it in the accident rates as, as the years go on. Oh, this is a, not a well-designed intersection. All right, through there. If, if we're doing... Um, Reverse curves and sharp curves, right? We try not to make any of them greater than 90 degrees. We're trying to avoid uh, too sharp of a curve, right? We don't want people coming around and turning through an entire 120 degrees or something like that. That's bad, right? That's that's a, um, a complicated maneuver. And we're trying to keep it down to around 90 degrees. And that's plus or minus a few in there. 90 would be the best, ideally, where we'd end up. You can go a little more than that. But, but don't try to go to 120, right? That's not good. Uh, through there. Conflict area, we're trying to minimize the number of, of conflicting paths, right? And so where cars could get into conflict with somebody else, where a wreck could occur, we're trying to minimize that. And uh, and that's usually where these, these merging and weaving areas are, right? Uh, through that. If you have a short merge and weave, people have to jump over real quick to get back into, say, the, the main flow of traffic. That's not good, right? That's uh, We want to stretch those out as far as possible, give people more time to find a gap and, and get in, uh, get into the mainstream of traffic as they're moving through, right? And just like we talked about, don't have too sharp a turning path, 
uh, for any one movement at your intersection. We also want to make sure our cross traffic, these are, again, this is intersection design. There's always some cross traffic, right? It's the whole point of an intersection uh, through there. So our cross traffic, we're trying to keep that at 90 degrees. All right through and we can go up to between 60 and 120 degrees would be considered acceptable but we want to be within 90 in fact i'd say 90 plus or minus 10 degrees would be the preferred uh, right right through there and in 90 degrees we say there's no skew as you go above or below 90 degrees we'd say it's a skewed intersection uh, so it's and what's wrong with the skewed intersection what's wrong with not intersecting 90 degrees anyone Right? They're dangerous. They're a little more dangerous. People have to turn their head further to be able to see what's what's going on. So if you come up at an intersection that's at 60 degrees, you really have to turn your head, like say it's to the left, far to the left, much farther than normal, to be able to see cars coming from that direction. And then to look back the other way, it's it's quite a turn back through there. Um, that's just not as safe, right? And we'll see that in accident rates too. So again, that's why we don't like we don't like skewed intersections. We don't like high angle. Uh, or acute uh, angle intersections like that. We like to try to keep as close to 90 as we can uh, through that. <coughs> we also, um, they call it a refuge area on this slide for turning vehicles. That's where the turning vehicles are waiting. It shouldn't interfere with the through vehicles. And so if turning vehicles have to get over, say, a right turn lane, we want to make sure they get over in time. They're not going to interfere with through movement of vehicles. And we talked about that last time, too, the one... That one intersection design we looked at had a very long right turn lane that got the vehicles out of the through lane and didn't interfere with them uh, through that. So some more design principles for, uh, for channelization is prohibited terms. If a prohibited turn is there, we should try to physically block it. We should try to use our channelization to keep people from being able to do something we don't want them to do. That was, again, the example we saw at the end of the last lecture, which was that that you know, pork chop island it was a right turn in right turn out uh, access to a strip mall uh, along county road 17 there people were making that left turn across oncoming traffic and getting into wrecks it was technically prohibited but they could physically do it and so they did <laughs> it's, um, it's kind of like uh, being a parent of a teenager right um, they will do anything they can get away with, or maybe even smaller kids is in the same case. Same with drivers, right? If they can do it, they will try. And so uh, we try to use islands and, and physically blocking things to uh, enforce the rules and enforce the safety of an intersection, right? We don't usually just arbitrarily make these rules up. It's usually because of safety that there's, there's a rule in place. And that's where we try to use an island to physically block some of these turns that we don't want, right? So the, the little meeting out in front of the KFC there on Sturdy at US 30, that's a good example of blocking off people from turning in, uh, crossing traffic to try to get into that gas station there at the speedway. So we used a, we used a physical barrier to block a prohibited turn in that case, right? Um, when we're designing these, we want to make sure we know where the traffic control devices go. When they say traffic control devices, okay, it's not that hard to, to locate stop signs if it's just going to be stop controlled. Typically, it's the traffic signals, which are going to be the bigger piece of that. All right, so that's what you'll, you'll be looking for when you're designing this is where are those going to be, and we'll design around them often. Uh, we Sometimes we'll locate those first, and we'll design around them uh, through that. So channelization, we're trying to separate the conflicting uh, traffic movements and define the path that we want people to use. And so we want you to be able to turn right here and we're going to make you a special little road called a turning roadway. And that's going to help you turn right. So we define that path for right turning vehicles through there. We do that with traffic islands and pavement markings uh, to help that out. And actually islands can be um, striped which was a pavement marking. We're just painting on the on the uh, roadway. We call that striping. Um, you can just stripe islands, and sometimes we do, right? And then, but a real decent island, a nice island, uh, we're going to use that with. We're going to raise that island up and have a curb around it. And we're going to talk a lot about. Uh, those in a minute. So this was the AASHTO definition of what that channelization is. So if you've got your green book, you can read that yourself. All right. So a traffic island, that's the area between traffic lanes that's used to regulate the movement. So right, we split off that right turn lane. That area in between is that traffic island right through there. And we typically use that as a pedestrian refuge. If there are, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> if there are pedestrians out there 
will use it as a place for pedestrians to stand and wait as they cross the road to get out of traffic as a safe spot for them. So vehicular traffic is not supposed to drive on the island occasionally, um, especially in slippery conditions. In the winter, people do drive right across the islands. It's not, this never ends well uh, for anybody uh, on that, it's particularly not um, traffic signal control hardware, which may be on that island through there and not usually for the car either if it hits something on that. And so we also, so we provide that refuge area for pedestrians and again for control devices, stop signs or the traffic signals out there. We can, we can form those islands by using a raised curb. And so that's, we've talked about before cross-section elements about curbs. You can just use pavement markings or striping, we sometimes call it, or you can just physically have the pavement end there and then there's grass, right? So that's the pavement edge. There is no more pavement and you just got a grassy strip uh, there and that's the edge, right? And hopefully people can, can delineate and see that that edge. Uh, so those are the three things we can use to form a traffic island out of that. And again, kind of the low budget way to do that would be, you know, with, with our pavement edges here. Uh, through that and it's typically more of a um, like county roads city streets and so forth in a, a rural area not so fancy that's the cheap way to go is just to use the pavement edges through there and that's often more of a lower volume uh, setting when you get higher volumes you're going to want the, the raised curbs if nothing else for the refuge effect they're also easier to see it's uh, and so when you get higher volumes it's more important uh, to use raised curbs in that that situation pavement markings are kind of in the middle all right they're not as easy to see especially at night um, and especially in snow or rain, uh, when you're, especially at night in a rainstorm, the, a lot of times those pavement markings are really hard to find. They don't shine very well at all when they have water on top of them uh, through there. So that's where the raised curb is going to be better. But then again, raised curbs have a little bit of a hazard uh, issue with them too, if you're out on a higher speed road. So there's a little bit of trade-off as you go through. So here's an example of raised curb at an island, obviously a little bit older pictures through here. This is from the green book. This is, you can see the raised curb through there. So it's actually delineating traffic and we're dividing the traffic. Uh, through there and we're showing traffic where we want them to go now in this case there is no pedestrian refuge because there's no pedestrian crossing right at that location right through here this is an example of where you're just using pavement markings striping to to show where you want cars to go and you're delineating that through here and it looks to me like they needed probably a, a center dotted line here unless this is parking is allowed it's pretty wide <laughs> pretty wide for a lane uh, <coughs> along there Right, but at least in the center here, we've got uh, we've got some delineation. And we're showing people where to line up as they come into the intersection. The intersection will be back down, back down here in this picture, All right through there. So let's talk about curved islands. Uh, it's usually a concrete curb that delineates it. You can use asphalt curb. It's not very common, but typically in an urban environment, we're going to use the concrete curb. It's you know fairly durable uh, through there. Contractors are are pretty good at putting in concrete curbs they've got special equipment and special forms they can usually slip form these things really quickly once they get them all string lined up they can just roll right through and, and do all of your curbs as you go through and uh, minimize the handwork uh, through there so that's what we normally do we normally put in concrete curb through there there's two kinds we've got mountable and barrier curbs we've, we've talked about those again before during our uh, talk about the cross-section elements through that right so a mountable curb it's got about a 45 degree angle on the face of the curb and so cars can get up over it if they need to or if they're errant and going off out of their lane uh, it doesn't it doesn't do much that much damage hopefully none to the car if they were to go up onto it and so sometimes where there's some wide turns uh, we'll throw a mountable curb in there just because we kind of guess occasionally someone's going to run up on it probably a truck as it comes through barrier curb has a vertical face or almost vertical it's not quite perfectly vertical face uh, to that yeah bigger vehicles can go up over those but they don't usually it's a you'll definitely know you hit a barrier curb no matter what size of vehicle you're driving uh, through there and they call them a barrier for that for that reason is that we're we're trying to keep people off of them right through there you definitely we're creating that barrier to keep you from going up into the island 
we'll want to use those more where we've got pedestrians uh, for the refuge island. Here's some examples. This is the Malleable Curb. This is around the radius at an intersection. This is a really gentle, this is more of a rolled curb. Uh, it's a, a form of a Malleable Curb. We'd call this a rolled one. If you still have the invert in here to carry the water, you can see where it has been, where it's discolored. Uh, through that. Here's an example out at an intersection. We've got mountable curve coming through here. It's sloped down, but we know that as a truck comes around here, they're probably going to, their wheels are going to run up along the back uh, through that. We really wanted it out here, but they had to cut this back to get trucks around, but they probably couldn't get the utility company to move this pole, not in a timely fashion. And so that's why <laughs> they didn't make this radius even bigger, uh, likely. I'm kind of guessing uh, from what we're seeing here. They are trying to get passenger cars to come all the way around. You can see here they put this striping in out here. These are reflectors, so at night you would see that and to keep people off of it. But if there are trucks, even probably straight trucks, their rear tires are going to go up over this area. So this is, you can drive over that. That's a mountable uh, piece on that. Barrier curbs have that uh, much flatter front to them. Here's a good example Here's, uh, of the barrier curb along there. You can see you can definitely... Um, that's going to be hard to, to drive over, right? You know, a truck will do it occasionally. <laughs> they definitely can still figure a way out uh, of getting over your curb. But this is going to be uh, much more of a barrier, hence the name, uh, of keeping traffic off of this island. We don't want people crushing all the landscape down here. That stuff's expensive and hard to maintain through that. So that's where we'll use a barrier curb. And this is creating a pedestrian refuge, right? So back here, this is a divisional island, but it's also creating a refuge. And so this is a, a pedestrian refuge piece. You could stand here. You've got barrier curb on either side of you and foliage even. So uh, that's giving a very clear indication to drivers that they come either direction through here to stay away from this area. And that should be at a safer place for a pedestrian to stand. And they can finish their crossing here. This is an unsignalized crossing, right? So if there's a heavy traffic, you could cross one lane, wait here, and then cross the next. And that's where we, that's why we like the refuge type islands. Uh, through that. You can see over here, this is a divisional island and we're just using barrier curve to keep people off the, the landscaping out through there. Like I said, there's a lot of different uh, shapes and sizes of curb and we've had, we saw even more during the, the cross-sectional piece. This is your classic barrier curb one and it's not a, quite a perfect um, vertical face. It's slightly sloped back. Uh, through there. Six to eight inches is the normal. Uh, most places we're going to use six. Some locations will use eight if we really want to keep people off of that. It's pretty good. Not many vehicles can get up over an eight inch curb. Some bigger ones can get up over a six inch curb uh, through there. Through that. This would be what a malleable curb would look like one of these two. Those are more of our malleable type uh, curbs. That'd be our standard uh, size ones. Their total height is usually around that four inch mark. That's the ones I've used in the past. I try to typically use a four inch malleable curb. In dot, that's what their, their preferred malleable curb is. Uh, through that, if you've got a curved island, just keep in mind that these things can be hard to see at night. <clears throat> and you should try to use reflectors or um, <clears throat> have street lighting nearby. So if you've got street lighting nearby, it's if you don't paint the curb, it's white. It should be white if it's concrete, right? Um, it's still going to be fairly visible if you have street lighting nearby. But it doesn't hurt. Uh, you can paint it or you can put these reflectors on the top. So these are these nice little uh, reflectors, just like we put in the center of the road sometimes. They've got reflective faces on both sides of them. Um, so they'll light up pretty nice at night through there. You can see back at this picture, they used uh, a whole hazard uh, warning sign on either end of that. Right. So this is, I think, from Seattle. This picture, they like these out here out there better. Uh, but this is an object marker. It's a type of an object marker. And so they can just post those right at the end. Pretty clear indication there's something there. Don't hit me. <laughs> right. Um, probably doesn't look, can't tell for sure. Probably not great street lighting around here. <clears throat> so this will really help drivers at night to know where they're at. They also have this double yellow line, which is reflective, striping, right, uh, coming around the end of that uh, to kind of guide people off of it as well. So keep those in mind uh, as you come through that. Curb islands, we typically like those, again, in more of an urban environment. And definitely where there's pedestrians, we're going to want to go with the curbed island for that refuge effect uh, and keeping that through there. All right. So traffic islands, we serve three main functions, right? The main three thing reasons we would use an island are channelization, 
division and refuge. Those are the three big divisions uh, of reasonings uh, why we would choose an island to use an island in any, in any situation. All right, channelization is all about traffic and keeping traffic moving safely and efficiently. So that's channelization. We're putting you into a certain lane to line you up at the intersection uh, properly so that you can move efficiently through the intersection. That's channelization uh, usually. Division is we're trying to keep uh, traffic that's moving in different directions away from each other. So we're it's like on a freeway, we often have medians, almost always a median, it's either a concrete barrier or it's grass. That's a division. That's a type of, it'd be kind of like a, a division island, right, through there. We're just trying to keep uh, keeping traffic separated. That's going in different directions. And then the final reason is that refuge, we've talked about that already, that's a safe place for pedestrians to stand and get out of traffic, right? Especially if they've got, um, if they're crossing in stages, a crossroad like that picture we just saw where they're going across one lane and maybe across the next, that's a refuge. Uh, so we'll use islands for that, right? Quite often the island will do more than one thing, right? We almost, eh, not always, I have occasionally use an island just for refuge, but it's usually I'm doing something else with it, channelization or division, and I'm also adding in refuge as a piece of it. Um, channelization is the number one reason I usually use an island at, at an intersection. If there's pedestrians nearby, I also use it for refuge. So that's an example where you'd use more than one function at a time, right? Channelized islands, they help eliminate some of that confusion for drivers. They help, help drivers to get into the right lane. They, you have excess island or you have excess space <clears throat> at the islands quite often, right? And so instead of just having all this wide open space and no one's really sure where they're supposed to line up, we put an island in there and like, oh, now I know I need to get over here if I'm turning right. Otherwise, if it's so, if it's such a, you know, an acre of asphalt out there, you're not quite sure where you're supposed to be. Um, people do dumb things, right? You'll get two people parked side by side, both trying to turn right because one guy was out too close to the center and one guy was over here on the edge. Um, the islands use up that excess space and make a, make a better operating intersection out of it. Typically, we have that extra space because we had to make such a wide radius uh, for trucks to turn. That's one of the main reasons we have that excess space, right? Uh, we can use islands to separate the turn right turn traffic through through traffic, and we also sometimes do it with left turn traffic, not as often, right, through there. And we also can use a curved or a central island for guiding turning vehicles. Again, um, it's more of the left turn vehicles through there. Here's some examples where we might throw islands in. It looks very similar to the channelization picture we saw last time, right? So down here, these, these islands are helping channelization because they're showing where this left turn bay is. But the main reason probably for this island is division. We're dividing traffic going this direction. Whoa, back up. Between traffic going that direction. All right, here's a divisional island. You turn that corner, we want you to line up properly to come out. And as you're coming in, we want you to line up properly <clears throat> to go across this intersection. So we throw an island in here that channelizes you and puts you where we want you. All right, so that you'll make a safe movement uh, through that. Kind of the same thing over here. Once you turn, we're going to channelize you in here so you're shooting straight on this direction. This right turn island, this is a really probably one of the more common ones we use uh, through that. This is channelization. We're showing you where to turn right through there. All right, so if we didn't have this island in here, think how wide this would be. You could get one person coming here trying to turn and maybe waiting for cross traffic to clear. When somebody else comes up next to him over here, if that island wasn't there, you know, it can be confusing to have too much space. So that's why we sometimes throw islands in. Here's an example of a T intersection at a slight angle, right? We're making sure people um, come around and make this arc through here. And we're also channelizing people who want to turn this way and come up uh, through that. They have to come on this side of the island, right? Here's our little island right there. So that they don't come across here and just wait right here and block this intersection. You know, maybe people can still get around them that way. Uh, this was a project up at County Road 17 and County Road 6 in Elkhart County. 
Um, it was uh, when he did the last Google satellite pics for this, it was freshly striped. And so it's really easy to see the channelization. And it's a, it was a big intersection. He had a lot of uh, extra turn lanes and channelization. Here's a good example. There's a subdivision down here. So this is a public road entrance into a subdivision, some housing area in here, right? So we've got a little baby left turn lane because that was before people were stopping out in the main road and no one could get around them. So we've got this little tiny uh, turn bay or pocket, we might call that one, uh, through there. And people can get around them, right? And if you get around them here and then you come down here, okay, now I've got channelization. This is all striping. There's no hard barriers there. I've got striping, so I know I'm in the right place. But here I'm coming up on this left turn lane. And this is legitimately how long the decel length is at 55 miles per hour uh, for a left turn lane. So starting from here is where you let off the gas. You can decelerate and you can be stopped by this point. Uh, fairly gently, right, without a hard braking maneuver through that. So this is a good channelization. We've got these chevrons in here to keep people off of that, that uh, shaded in area. The, the one thing here is this is exactly the width of what this lane is, uh, right? So in the future, if they wanted to add a double left turn lane, they can take the striping out and put in another left turn lane. So that gives them some flexibility in there. That's one of the reasons they did this. Uh, this way. So here's some good channelization. If you're going straight or turning right, you stay in this channel over here. Now, at the time they took this picture, it's still under construction. So there's contractor's trucks parked out here. <laughs> That's right. That's not normally there. We don't usually use the striped island to park contractor vehicles, but hey, it works, right? It was a good spot for them on that day. Here's the coming down. This is where we were just looking at over here on the right. Down here is the main intersection. All right. So there's a lot of lanes in here. Here's a double left turning left crossed here. We've got dotted lines in here helping with channelization uh, through that. This southbound left turn lane, you see this comes down. This is a great, nicely done channelization all the way down. We bring it over here, all right? Why do we want to bring that over so far, right? Why don't we just set it over here right next to the through lanes? Isn't that easier? Why did we stripe all this with white uh, and bring that channelization over here? Why would we want to do that? So the question, the answer is safety. This is a safety issue. We want to line these people up over here to get them as close to where they're going as they can. And these people are turning left over here, right? So they're going to be coming around here. The same time this person gets a green arrow and turns. So they're going to be working this one and this movement at the same time. If we had them over here, it's more likely if they're swinging wide or a truck, they're going to get into this turn lane movement, right? So it's not quite as safe. We like to offset those. And also, if it's a permissive turn, which this one is not anymore, but if it had been a permissive uh, turn, which you can turn on a, a green indication without an arrow, if no one's coming, right? If you're lined up straight across from somebody, you can't see these through lanes back here of people approaching. It's 55 miles per hour out here. You wouldn't be able to see those in time. If you skew these over, offset them from the one over here, you can see. Yeah, much better then. So that's another reason for channelization and how we do that, right? So this was a good example of striping using pavement markings uh, for channelization through that. All right, so here's channelization. This is one you should be familiar with. This is our roundabout out here just next to campus, all right? So what's the purpose of all these islands? All right, so we talked about the three main purposes. All right, so we've got channelization, we've got division, and we've got refuge. So which, what are these items? What's this one? What's this one being used for? And it actually extends down here, right? This is a little narrower width. There's no grass, but that is still an island down there. All right. This is actually probably all three, right? It starts out as division down, down here, and south of the you know, roundabout. It's mostly for division, right, through that. This is channelization up here. We're moving people around. We want them to arc as they start into their surroundabout. So we're lining them up and we're using the island as the guide to line them up to the proper orientation so they can go straight across here. Oops, back up. Shouldn't. And then we're also doing refuge, right? We made these islands big enough that as you cross this crosswalk, you have a place to, to wait here safely. And so that's refuge. Through that. So actually these are probably, especially this one and these center islands are doing a little bit of all three of those, of those functions that we normally do, 
right through that. This is also a good example down here of using the island to physically make it impossible to do a prohibited turn. All right, so we don't want people coming into to Dairy Queen. We don't want these people coming down here, slamming on the brakes, waiting for cars to clear, and then crossing and getting here, because that's going to cause wrecks, right? Uh, if nothing else, people are coming in here, they're looking at the roundabout, they're not looking at people turning left, so they're, that's an that's issue, that's a safety issue to start with, and we don't want people just as they leave the roundabout to hit the brakes and wait to turn in, because people coming through here may be looking this direction to make sure they can merge in safely. They're not going to be, may not be paying attention to stopped cars here. So it's a really bad place to stop cars. So we put an island in, you can't turn left in here, right? So this is a right in, right out um, driveway. And the same thing over here, we didn't want people from Laporte coming out and turning left, so you can't, yeah, right, do that. Um, and we don't want people going north, waiting to turn left on the Laporte, so that's prohibited also by that, by that island. So this is a good use of, of that island um, to restrict um, prohibited or undesirable uh, movements for vehicles. So here's another island. So we, this is up in Mishawaka in, uh, in northern Indiana, right? So this is northbound Main Street. Here's southbound Main Street uh, through that. What's what's up with these islands, right? So look at this. We'll start up here. Here's this island. We have a weird pork chop shape. Turns into more of a median island. Stops here. Here's another end here, right? So if you're headed south, Right, this is a Culver's and a car wash over here and a Giro place. So if you wanted to go to Culver's or the Giro place, you're trying to come into this driveway, head south. Right here you come down this way, you can pull into this, and you only have to wait for cars going north. There's a stop light right down here at the bottom. Once you get a gap, when that light goes red, it's safe to pull across, and that's not too bad, right? Well, don't we want people to do? We don't want people coming out here and trying to turn left on the main. That's pretty dangerous. It was proven to be dangerous uh, through there. So they build all these medians in here, right? So that's uh, probably impossible uh, to get out here unless you came out, wiggled through that, and then did a U-turn. But um, that would be pretty gutsy. I don't think people, I've never seen anyone try that. Right through there, and these are specifically designed islands to keep that from happening. Uh, to keep, and nor can you go north and try to turn left into any of these ones, right? So, this is prohibiting uh, turns. It's also a divisional island, but it's mostly channelization. Channelization would be its main use in this case, right? So, that's another good example. All right, so divisional islands, we use those intersections of undivided highways to alert drivers when you're approaching intersections. So, a divisional one. Um, off and you'll see that island come up and you're like, oh, I'm coming up on the intersection, right? It's a, it jogs your, your memory, like, okay, intersection coming, I gotta be ready for it, right? Um, we don't, you don't normally find an island out all by itself and nothing near it, right? It's usually as you approach an urbanized uh, zone and something's going on. So that's a warning system uh, through there. And we can control left turns at these skewed intersections. So that's how we can use divisional islands in that. So here's, here's examples, right? This would be, uh, open road situation, all of a sudden there's an island, you're like, oh, I must be, something's about to happen, right? There's an island out here. And you're dividing that traffic and you're helping to control how that left turn happens. People aren't going to wait in this lane trying to turn left and block all the cars behind them. When they come up here, they can move over and, and turn. This is like US 30, that big grass median. You can pull out of the through lanes if you need to and make that turn. All right here's Divisional Island. Uh, as well on the skew uh, and so forth. And here's, uh, again, back in Mishawaka, they've got lots of islands on Main Street out there. That's a, one of their, <coughs> for landscaping, probably. Do that. So this is our divisional islands. It's warning you you're coming up to an intersection. And it's also making sure you get over where you need to be. And the city links are pretty, so they plant, you know, trees and shrubs and pretty stuff in there. Um, and that's uh, beautification. All right, so it's a boulevard effect using the divisional islands for that. This is also a main street in, in Mishawaka. It's down near the old downtown, uh, just south of the river in Mishawaka. You can see how we come up here. We've got our divisional islands, and so it's dividing these roads. It's also helping delineate where this left turn lane is, right? So that kind of helps. This is a nice use of a divisional island, right? We've got the division island here. You're forcing people to stay in these through lanes, and then we pop open this left turn lane. So 
Um, you can't just come straight across here and just continue on to the left lane. That's dangerous. You're going to scare people. If you were in the left turn lane, you didn't turn left. The island forces you to uh, stay in this through lane until you're here and then use that left turn lane uh, and get in that. So it's another good use of uh, divisional islands uh, through there. Refuge islands, sometimes we call them a pedestrian island uh, because that's who's refuging on it is a pedestrian uh, to get to keep them safe. Again, it's almost always at an urban intersection where we're going to use these. Uh, we want to usually make sure that uh, they're they're big enough, they're wide enough, the island itself is large enough that you can handle wheelchairs uh, and or bikes. Yeah, typically, actually, bikes are, are, are a little bit longer. You need about uh, six to eight feet of width, you know, to to comfortably um, park a bike on uh, through there. Wheelchair is a little bit less, but still you want to, you've got to make sure you've got enough space for that true refuge. You, the, a refuge island can't be too small, right? You've got to be careful it's big enough uh, to manage it, right? Um, you can also use it for unloading uh, passengers off buses right, through there. So sometimes the bus will stop and use an, a refuge island, uh, typically more on the right turn. If there's a wide right turn uh, lane, bus can use it. It's not that common, but it's a possibility uh, through there. A traffic island needs to be big enough to command attention, right? We actually don't want small islands. Small islands are dangerous. Uh, people can't see them well enough, <coughs> and they'll run up on them, especially at night. Uh, and they're just not big enough to attract attention. And so that's uh, that's a reason that, and this is one of your quiz questions, that's the reason we have all of these minimum sizes on there. It's really safety. Safety is the reason. Because you, if it's not big enough, people don't notice it. Uh, particularly at night, but even during the day. Uh, small little islands, people aren't going to notice it, right? So you need to command driver's attention. It has to be a certain size. So these are, uh, based on years of experience in the traffic industry, these are the minimum sizes they found have worked, right? Preferably a curved island is at least 100 square feet total. Right? You can get by a little bit less, especially if in a, a more dense urban environment like downtown Valpo, smaller island is probably okay because people are driving small and are driving slow anyway. And they're, they're expecting um, pedestrians, they're expecting uh, not to be moving fast through there. So a smaller island might be okay there. We'd like to go 100 square feet uh, minimum size, right? It's okay to be bigger. It's not okay to be smaller. Uh, through this. Um, triangular, island, triangular islands, and that's more like that right turn type islands uh, through there. Like each side of it, each side of that triangle, we'd like to be at least 15 feet long. And that, again, gives drivers a chance to see it better and, and look at it. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see if all these self-driving cars, how good their algorithms are, if um, if maybe they can pick up smaller islands than a human eye pays attention to. I don't know. Maybe they need a bigger island to, to see them well and to avoid them. So uh, if that ever becomes more widespread, we'll find out, right? Maybe we'll change these, these parameters later. On divisional islands, you know, if you're going to put a divisional island there, it better be at least 25 feet long, right? Don't just do a, a dorky little 10-footer. <laughs> All right, if you're going to do a divisional island, make sure you're you're using it well and you're you're using it to its, its best advantage. There's not too many places I could think of where a short little island like that's going to be any use at all. Right? I would say typically 50 to 100 feet is more likely uh, for that. But so these these are minimum sizes again to be to be conspicuous for drivers to be able to see well right, through there. Uh, for curved divisional islands at isolated intersections on a high speed road, the, the minimum side length is 100 feet. So uh, and preferably even more than that. So again, at 55 miles per hour, you need a bigger a much bigger island to be conspicuous, right, at that kind of speed because people come up on it so fast uh, through there, right? Remember, it takes, what, 55 miles per hour, 495 feet to stop, wasn't that stopping site distance? That's, um, you know, that's, what, two and a half seconds plus your stopping distance. You know, you come up on this stuff really fast, you need a much bigger island uh, for that. Width is important because that's what catches your eye. Right? We try to use a minimum of a four width, four foot wide uh, divisional island, particularly divisional islands we're looking at on these. Sometimes you can get by with a two footer, um, but that's not going to be wide enough for usually to be noticed, right? The four foot one catches people's eye, and that's what we, we typically use, right? Uh, through there. And we often use the, the barrier curb on these, uh, which would be a six inch tall uh, barrier curb one. All right. That's, um, that's all for this 
this lecture. Next time we're going to continue on with channelization, talk some more about islands and actual design and how to design uh, for that. All right, see you next time.